Good evening. I'm Anuj Marhotra, Dean of the George Washington University School of Business, and it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this episode in the George Talks Business Series, hosted in partnership with GW Department of Athletics. And I'm really delighted to welcome two guests today, Dr. William Chappell, Vice President and Chief Technology Officer for the Strategic Missions and Technologies Division at Microsoft, and Nitin Natarajan, Deputy Director for the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA. Welcome to both of you. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Thank you for having me. Great. And we will also be taking some audience questions. Please submit your questions via pigeonhole using the QR code, and this will, they will arrive here somehow. I have multiple screens here to look at, and we will then, of course, be able to hopefully take some of those questions towards the end. Let's jump right in. Um, I will, because there are so many students in the live audience here today, I want to ask a question that one of the students has submitted. And it is a multiple choice question, I think, because it says, are you more hopeful or fearful about the future of emerging technologies? Let's start with you. All right, so as an engineer, uh, you know, I'm an optimist. And I think it really helps to be an optimist in, in this field. And if I look through the arc of the last century, right, the technical progress is, is you know, hard to you know, really imagine, right? And if you look at, you know, as a scientist, you look at the metrics, like, they might not feel better every day, but you actually can go over the last century and say, oh, you know, quality of life has, you know, been incredibly improved. And so someone has to prove to me why that arc of history is about to bend or something is going to change. So I am an optimist in, in general and that more technology has been an improvement. So I life. take that as an answer, A, hopeful. What hopeful. about you, Nathan? There you go. C, all the above. <laughs> <laughs> I knew there would be something like that. Well, anyway, you are, you are an optimist. You are, you are saying you're hopeful, but still you must have some concerns. Absolutely. So what is your top concern that comes to mind? Yeah, the speed of innovation and the speed of change is you know, it, it's an exponential. And, you know, every week, you know, even in the lab, I walk in and I'm, you know, I was a professor for 10 years and you go to the lab and you love the innovation, that aha moment. And like, mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, that's happening on a weekly basis where it might be in a monthly or, you know, a six month basis. And so as a technologist, it's amazing in terms of the disruption that's happening, right? It is a, at an ex exponential pace. So Nitin, uh, that's, that, I understand that. Nitin, you said you are all of the above. Let me give you a chance to explain that all of the above and what would your top concern be with all the, you know, the, the new technology and emerging technologies that are there? So I, I will say I'm very excited about new and emerging technologies. And again, I think the speed and pace at which we're seeing new innovation and new technologies um, is growing exponentially. What I worry about in, in, in my day to day isn't, it, I'm, where I'm excited about how we're gonna use that technology to help our mission, I'm also worried about our adversaries and how they're going to use that technology against us. And how do we essentially make sure that we're able to continue to stay one step ahead of the adversary uh, in how they implement the technology. And I think the challenge you know, with, with a government organization is, is we have, um, uh, or frankly, you know, we have rules, we have uh, laws that we follow, we have you know, a lot of strict guidelines. You know, and we're dealing with adversaries at times when you deal with nation states or you deal with cyber terrorists and cyber criminal organizations. They're not bound. Uh, by the same uh, ethics and laws that we're bound by, um, and really trying to see how are they going to leverage the technology for their gain. And so mm -hmm. that's why I truly see it um, as a double-edged uh, element that mm -hmm. I'm really optimistic, but I'm also uh, concerned about how our adversaries will use it for their optimism as well. Well, sure. So today, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but this is a Hindu festival of Dashera today, which is really a festival of uh, good prevailing over the evil, so to speak. And therefore, in the, on the WhatsApp groups, I was getting a lot of messages from family, from friends and whatnot. And then I get a message from somebody called Zain. And she says that she is India's first artificial intelligence supermodel. And she mm. sent me happy Dashera greetings today. <laughs> now I can tell you when I talk, and I, I watched it a few times just to make sure, but really, I mean, I couldn't tell that she is, is, is an AI supermodel. It seemed like somebody was being filmed and, 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 and I was talking to somebody real. Um, I've heard that in 30 seconds, people can copy your voice where it will sound like when a phone call comes, it is somebody you know who's talking to you. And with this, you know, videos, which are really fake videos, so to speak, which are able to create this. I want to understand this, obviously I can see on the personal level on how hurtful it can be or how problematic it can be. 
But perhaps from an organizational perspective, and let me start with you, Bill, how do these transfer, how these kind of concerns show up in the corporate world? Although you are an optimist, you must still I'm be an optimist, yeah. this. But yeah. no, you know, I think what's actually very interesting about it is the root of identity, right, is, is shifting digital identity is going to be, you know, significant, right? So how, how do you actually have things that are like physical roots of trust that go all the way through that uh, that interaction, you know, that you have. How do you watermark, or how do you, you know, put bounds on where the actual, you know, creation of that interaction ha has come from? And so, I do think that's a, a burden and, and an opportunity uh, that we all face, both government and, uh, you know, industry working together right, to be able to go all the way from, you know, creation of an, an engagement, right, and creation right, of that voice all the way through that that mm -hmm. interaction. So there is a telltale of you know, where that legacy you know, came from. So Nathan, how would it translate in, in the government side? So we spent a lot of time looking at, at new technology and making sure people are aware of technology that's out there. So you talk about things like deep fakes, you talk mm -hmm. about you know, uh, fake audio. A lot of these opportunities that, that are much easier now than they were 15, you know, 20 years ago. You look at phishing opportunities, um, and the, the technology has just gotten so much better, right? It used to be very easy to know when an email was fake, right? It was, the graphics were horrible, the English was horrible, you could, you could easily make it out. Um, but, you know, we're in a world today where I kind of jokingly say that there are still people out there who believe they're going to get a million dollars via email. And they're still going to get emails that promise a million dollars, and they're still going to click on a link, and they're going to still bring in, you know, the potential of an adversary in their networks. And I think we need to get people to understand that there is technology out there to create these types of videos and emails and systems and communication and voice communication um, that people do need to fact check. People do need to understand authenticity. People do need to understand the root uh, of where these messages and videos are coming from. And it's, it's all too easy. And we've seen this in even the last six months, right? People have posted videos during times of, of domestic or global conflict or of, of protests of things that weren't real. And just to incite a reaction or, or to influence the media or to influence individuals' opinions and getting people to have a higher index of suspicion and to really ask twice. And I know everything on the internet must be true, uh, <laughs> but really getting people to, uh, to think twice about what they're seeing, and, and, but also giving them the tools and capabilities to be able to differentiate between what is fake and what is real. Because it is hard, as you said. Mm -hmm. You have to look at things a, a few times mm -hmm. uh, to really make that, that decision. So let's, let's stick to the theme of business and organizations and government for a moment here more. And, and so how do you assess the risk of cyber and AI and, 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 and an organization? And maybe you can start, start, us, start uh, us out on this. And is it something you know, where the roles of CEOs, the board members, they also need to start thinking about how to assess risk and, uh, of cyber and AI for a, for a company or for an organization? because there is going to be evolution in this space and it is constantly evolving, the risks. So how do you go around, what is the framework in which you might think? So, so we have a whole uh, effort underway called Corporate Cyber Responsibility. And what we want to do is elevate the discussion of cybersecurity, and AI is, an, is a huge element of that, from the CISOs, really to CEOs and boards. And I, I look at risk as a three-legged stool. I think we spend a lot of time talking about risk identification in, in business. We spend a lot of time talking about risk mitigation. We forget the third leg of that stool, which is risk acceptance. Any risk we've identified and we've not been able to mitigate or chosen not to mitigate, we're accepting for our organizations. That risk acceptance should not reside solely with the CISO of an organization. That risk acceptance resides arguably with the CEOs and boards and in the public sector with senior elected officials. So really trying to elevate the conversation to make sure that CEOs and boards understand their risks within their organizations, that they're asking the right questions, that even if they're not technical subject matter experts that they can they can at least understand enough to, to dive deeper. And then the other piece of that, I think as we, as we talk to these groups, um, is looking at across the entire spectrum, so not just day-to-day -day operations, but even looking at things like M&A. When companies go out there and do M&A operations, they spend a lot of time looking at, at the fiscal, at the books, right, and making sure that, that these companies are fiscally sound. What are you doing to assess cybersecurity of these companies, right? These are organizations that you're going to bring into your network. You're going to connect them to your network. Are they truly secure? And what vulnerabilities are you introducing, you know, by doing this? Um, and really being able to kind of open up that aperture amongst the CEOs and boards to look at, at cybersecurity as a key element of their business operations. So maybe, uh, Bill, if you can uh, add to that, and see, you talked about some of the vulnerabilities that we are exposing mm -hmm. You know, in companies, we're talking about mergers and acquisitions. How, how do you start looking at their cybersecurity infrastructure? And is that playing a role when making a decision, especially from the lens of a CEO or a board, on which merger and acquisition is okay and which is not okay? 
Well, I think you know from the board all the way to the user, I, I do think that trust right, is now going to become definitional for what a company is, right? and so you know the cyber vulnerabilities uh, that have always existed, right now the potential for them to be even larger. Um, it really translates to, right, are you going to trust that company mergers and acquisitions or just are you going to operate with them? Are you going to combine your system with theirs, right? Or, you know, are you even going to use their product in the first place? So it is, you know, going to be just part of the brand, right? And so the brand damage that you can do by not doing the right thing is so severe now that I think that at the board level, you know, it, it is being watched at a level that it hasn't, you know, in, in the past. And that gives me uh, that gives me great hope that uh, you know you are going to see a shift in terms of the, of the behavior, in terms of the balance of you know, cyber risk versus you know actually paying for it. And I, I think actually you're seeing a lot of money spent. I mean, if you just look at the numbers, like there's not actually a lack of uh, dollars being spent on it. So like it went from not having enough attention to getting the right attention. And then the question is, you know, how effective is that actual spend you know, being? Let me follow up on a different angle, especially after COVID, and especially now we are probably still in remote or hybrid work environments. Yeah. Has that increased the cyber intrusions, and how do companies handle that part? Uh, you know, it goes back to that the identity. If you have the right identity stock, um, you've really shifted where the boundaries of security are. It used to be physical location. I have a computer. I know where it was. That's where my files were. And that physical location made me feel good because I knew exactly kind of where everything was. Now things are distributed right? in the cloud. You know, that's actually where things are more secure uh, quite often. But you have no physical you know, location specific to where your, your data is. You trust that there's a equivalent of a proximity boundary, but that is actually the logical boundary of, of the identity that you have being transferred to you know, where that information uh, can go. And that's why I think you know, identity is a really, really important part of, of this stack because it's basically you know, the equivalent of the new location. So, so Microsoft has built this Azure as a hyper cloud, yep. right? Hyper um, and scale cloud. And then you're calling it a world's computer. Yep. And you're calling it where you know, there can be collaboration from across the world, across the globe. Yep. And of course, uh, that, that opportunity exists, but it comes with increased risks. Yep. So um, tell us a little bit about the associated risks and how do you manage that? Yeah, so as, I, as it really relates to the prior question of like, you know, once you have the right identity stack, you know, who do you let in to a collaboration? The good news is you aren't physically bound anymore that you can't, you know, collaborate. Now it's about how you let people in uh, selectively based on, you know, the attributes that they, uh, that you give them or uh, that I identity. And so, um, Frankly, it has been a net uh, benefit uh, from security. When you have a problem, you can actually scan over very large uh, swaths to be able to find uh, those uh, vulnerabilities. So the ability to uh, have a, it's not a single location, it's, you know, it's the world's computer, it's in multiple countries, but what people think is that their data then goes everywhere. It's actually about how you control that flow of data, right? And so the art here, is to build a substrate where data can ride, you know, and on top of many, many computers without you actually knowing exactly where that physical location is, with the right regulatory boundaries and control of that data so that it's very specific to you and your regulatory uh, compliance. So that's a, you know, a massive amount of work that we do. And just one reason why it is more secure is you can do that at a scale that you couldn't do if you were just protecting your own single. Yeah. computer. So let me follow up a very similar question for you, Nitin, that when, when we talk about connected devices, when we talk about billions of connected devices, and we are constantly connected, we have variable technology that we have, um, there have to be risks that are much greater because of that along the same lines. And I was talking about Microsoft here, but in more, if you take it more general, how do companies, individuals, and governments need to, how, what can they do to mitigate and how to protect the data that is being shared all around? So I think you know we're really trying to promote more transparency and making sure that people understand what they're buying. You know, as you introduce new technology, you're introducing potential vulnerability, uh, both in our personal lives and professionally, and and making sure that there's 
good transparency and people understanding what they're actually purchasing. And so we have an effort underway looking at, we're calling secure by design, secure by default. And how do we really, um, as well as our uh, software build materials and hardware build materials. We want people to basically be able to know what it is that they're purchasing, understand where the software is coming from, where the hardware is coming from, and that they understand, again, they understand the risk they're introducing into their organization. And again, there's always some introduction of risk with new technology. Um, you know, I joke, we, we have refrigerators that connect to the internet these days. Um, I don't know what they do that my fridge doesn't, but we have internet connected fridges, and, and with that, I'm sure I've been trying to tell my refrigerator to the, the, get me a beer every now and then, never does. There's some, some vulnerability potentially. Um, but really get, making sure that people understand uh, what they're what dealing with. And I think the challenge we look, when we look at critical infrastructure, when we look at businesses, it's not, you know, the large businesses are able to do a lot of cloud migration. They're able to buy and install a lot of tools. You know, when we look at this, we look at things like water utilities. There's over 160,000 water utilities in this country. And in some of these water utilities in rural America, your CIO is also your CISO, is your water operator, is your CFO, is your CEO and is, is also you know the uh, the picnic planner right and the kind of everything in between. Mm -hmm. How do we get you know the, some of these critical utilities in the energy sector and healthcare that that you know where they they don't have that robust infrastructure to, to look at opportunities and services at scale? Some of that is things like migrating the cloud, where you mm -hmm. you know transition from from on-prem housing to the cloud, and that brings with it inherent security parameters that you can get at scale looking at, at services that are offered by the government and by other partners um, that can bring security at scale. And I think that there's, you know, making sure that, that when we're looking at, at small businesses, medium-sized businesses, that they're able to leverage these technologies in a way that introduces more security and more safety uh, so that those that can do the deep dives and understand what they're buying and understand the risk mm -hmm. can do so. And frankly, those that don't have that expertise, that ability to do so, can leverage existing resources to raise their resilience. Right. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking about the number of cyber attack signals that are analyzed by companies, such as Microsoft, probably trillions of them during a day, right? Mm -hmm. Trillions of them are currently uh, being analyzed and, and probably mitigated. From all of that data, from your lens, what do you see as the biggest national security threat? Well, I think the number I just saw is 34 trillion signals per day, right? And so, you know, so being able to see, you know, absorb that amount of information, make sense of it, right? They, you know, it's not a human staring at a screen anymore, right? That is, um, you know, advanced algorithms that are, are doing that um, analysis. So uh, you get to see, right, these you know, migrations of, of cyber, right, that sometimes stop at a specific border because you know, they're obviously maybe planned by a specific a uh, country that doesn't want you know that to cross the border, you get to see those sort of effects you know, when you see the globe uh, you know, operating uh, your software. So we have that ability to kind of have that uh, you know the broad uh, view. The worries that I have, um, you know, I, I think it's the complexity. Right? The, uh, so I think the the beauty of you know the the cloud as an example is that let's say I have two people running a water you know plant. Um, I don't want those two people to have to be an equivalent of IT people and water experts, and somehow they're going to defend against a nation state attack. Like it's just it's not going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. So being able to then push your data up where it has you know, broader levels of uh, protection is great. We then need to simplify how that can happen, right? So you don't have you know, so like a control set wrong or some other uh, exposure. And so uh, for me, I think the complexity of how you use some of these uh, more advanced tools needs to be simplified and, and standardized so that mm -hmm. there's, you know, anyone can actually use them and it's not just for the large uh, corporations. Would you like to add something from CISA's lens? Sure, I, I think that the, what worries me is, is twofold. So one is both the adversaries and the victim landscape that we're seeing. So I think when you look at the adversaries that we're focused on, traditionally we've talked a lot about nation states, you know, predominantly Russia, uh, China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, right, and looked at, at what they're doing. I think we also have an increase in cyber terrorists and cyber criminal organizations because we're seeing this from a, from a profit perspective. And so, you know, in addition on the, on the adversary side, it used to be hard if you wanted to become a cyber terrorist. Right, you had to recruit friends. You had to build infrastructure. You had to you had to do a lot to become a cyber a cyber criminal. You know, now we have things like ransomware as a service, where there are groups that'll do it for you. So as long as you have Bitcoin and an enemy, they'll conduct attacks on your behalf, keep a percentage off the top, and pay you. So I think the adversary landscape has changed significantly. That we're not just looking at big nation states, but we're looking at a lot of different groups that might be geographically located in some of these nations, geographically located outside. 
At the same time, we're seeing a change in the victim landscape. So there always used to be this perception that I'm not a large bank. I'm not a large federal agency. I'm not the Microsofts of the world. I don't have to worry about being attacked. What we see in the victim landscape as well is attacks against small rural K through 12 schools, attacks against healthcare facilities, attacks against water utilities, attacks against small businesses. So we're seeing this significant change, not just in the, in the adversary landscape, but also in the mm -hmm. victim landscape. And frankly, that's what worries me, is that we need to raise the resilience of everybody, not just targeting these large businesses that, that frankly have a great foundation mm -hmm. to build upon, mm -hmm. Because we're we're not, we're seeing people being attacked throughout the nation, urban, rural, large and small, across sectors, and so that victim landscape also needs to adjust. Yeah. So you actually bring up an excellent point here, which is also um, a question that is coming from Ryan, and it's related um, to this: is how does CISA balance cybersecurity needs with uh, constant physical threats against critical infrastructure? And maybe if you can start us out there, and I would love for you to take it over from a supply chain perspective, which are all global supply chains today, and it's the same kind of concept between thinking about the physical infrastructure and the cyber infrastructure, and how, how do we manage those? They can't possibly be independent anymore. So, but let me get you started. Yes, yeah, so this is actually pretty unique when you look at a lot of our global partners. We're one of the only organizations that is looking at cyber and physical security together. So when you compare us to our counterparts and a lot of other nations, they separate cyber and physical. We actually look at them together. I think there is that cyber physical nexus, that overlap in the Venn diagram, where a cyber incident can have physical consequence. Um, but we're also seeing, frankly, kinetic attacks against, uh, against uh, IT infrastructure. So really trying to look at both of those. And, and we're preparing against both. And how do we raise resilience in an organization? So we offer, we work with critical infrastructure owners and operators. We work with state, local, tribal, territorial governments to help raise resilience on both sides. So how do we help looking at things like physical security and, and those opportunities and assessments all the way through cybersecurity and making sure that organizations are being protected against both. And not just the large organizations, but really, as you mentioned, the entire supply chain. Mm -hmm. You know, How do we look at precursor chemical production, precursor microchip production, supply chain vulnerabilities, and transportation in production um, you know, over the long term? Um, and what impact that will have. And so really it, it's, a, it's a large undertaking when we look at this globally, um, but it, it needs, we feel strongly that it needs to be cyber and physical together uh, because that's what these organizations are facing and it can't be either or. And I think a lot of organizations have historically struggled and said, do I invest in physical security or do I invest in cyber security? And the answer is yes. <laughs> you need to look at both and it shouldn't be a competition between the two because both, that organization is facing threats from both sides. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so from the supply chain, you know, it's a very difficult um, problem. And when I was in the government for 10 years, we did a lot of work on how do you do inspection, how do you know what actually the foundation of your electronics uh, are, are based on. I do think that the government is doing a good job but can take a huge leadership role there. There are things that are, in essence, an act of war, right? If you are to poison a supply chain, that should be viewed as something that, you know, if it's you know, going to poison the supply chain, it goes into your car and it goes to your health maker, your pacemaker, or you go into a hospital, like that is something right, that should be viewed as something that's just, you know, the poisoning the foundation of our society since the digital infrastructure is a part of the, uh, the you know, the, the lifeblood of how we uh, operate. And so uh, I think you know, some you can inspect for, and then there should be some things that just be ra raised up at that sort of nation state level. And the hard part is getting to attribution, right? So focusing on you know, if you have those rules to say, if you were to uh, you know, do something in the supply chain, then you know, that would raise above something that would have dramatic uh, action. You know, that would definitely promote the government to, to raise, that, uh, raise that bar. So, yeah. Well, there are a lot of questions already coming in, and I haven't even repeated my call for questions. So let me take a couple of questions that are coming in before I jump into another topic that I had in mind to discuss. But uh, there's, this is a question from Professor Bonnie Pierce saying, certain nation states fund their cybersecurity or hackers to get better, many times at our expense. What are we doing to train white hat hackers to defend our corporate and national security? So, I'm happy to, so, so I think you know, there's a lot of efforts underway, I think, both on the federal government side, but really looking at academia and really leaning on, on our academic partners to get education 
um, into the workforce. We have a lot of efforts underway to upskill and reskill. We have a lot of people coming into cybersecurity, uh, not, you know, fresh out of high school and coming into security as second and third careers. Um, so I think we've really tried to focus on the education that we're able to provide on the federal side. But again, we are a very small piece of that, really leaning on industry partners that have created a lot of academic and, uh, and training programs and working with, um, you know, with the colleagues in academia. I think the one thing that we've seen interesting when you talk about ethical hackers and you talk about that the community, there's been much more over the last five to ten years, I think, of, of a um, partnership between the federal government and that community, right? So earlier this year, I was at DEF CON. I was on a panel um, at the what's essentially an annual hacker conference. And, you know, ten years ago, you would never see a government employee uh, at these conferences, much less on the <laughs> stage, uh, you know, w with our partners. But I think you know a lot of uh, folks on the defense of, in the cybersecurity community acknowledge the fact that it truly needs to be a partnership. We have a lot we can learn uh, from the community, and we want to work closely with them to understand. Uh, and similarly, we want to make sure that we're getting the right resources out uh, to help partners get the education. So I think there's a lot that's been done, but there's a lot more we need to do. That's one area where I'm actually you know, pretty excited that you know the, the system sort of works, right? We needed more you know focus on cyber. There's a massive increase in computer scientists right, over the last decade. As an electrical engineer, actually, like maybe at the detriment of the electrical engineering numbers, but computer science did you know, double, triple. You, know, you had this, this massive influx of uh, computer scientists, which I think is, is great. Right? And it's actually, it wasn't a government policy that actually did it. Right? The demand signal mm -hmm. translates into smart people going to where it's most interesting. And really, the, that community became like both interesting, both monetarily, but also just in its role in, in society. So I actually think that you could always do more, right? And that's, uh, but you know, net, net, we're really good at just allowing these things to actually happen without a heavy handed government policy that says, you know, 10,000 new people need to study you know, hacking today, right? Like that doesn't really work. And so I think things like DEF CON are, are great. You know, we just announced, uh, so I was at DARPA, we, uh, did our Cyber Grand Challenge uh, at DEF CON, which was AI on AI, uh, you know, cyber, uh, you know, capture the flag. Um, I think started to loosen up, like the, it, some people actually came from that community to help run that. We just announced at DEF CON this year supporting what's, I, what's AICC, which is a DARPA program, uh, which I would encourage anyone, any student here to actually look at. And I think it's the intersection of large language models and cyber vulnerabilities, and how do you find cyber vulnerabilities in critical infrastructure? And what I think that the uh, software community has done really well is, you know, if you're really good at hacking and no one can observe that, then you're going to go make money because that's just how people work. And you can actually go show your skills in so many different forums now, right? And how many GitHub check-ins you have, and the stars in your code, right, matter as much as maybe your degree. Right? And so you allow people an outlet to shine, whether it's some of these competitions or these various ways. Electrical engineering, for example, right, you have to get a degree, maybe five years, you do a circuit design. Like, there's actually all of these things that you have to do to prove yourself mm -hmm. that I'm actually jealous of the hacking community. Can you kind of do this very <laughs> quick spin? You know, if you're good, you're going to be rewarded. And that actually gives people an outlet. And there's more money to do good, frankly, than, than bad, hopefully, mm -hmm. knock on wood. Right, and hopefully you also have ethics, right? So you do good instead of bad, but you have an outlet, and you don't have these people that are like, I didn't go to college, so I don't get to go work at that, you know, that company, right? And that type of frustration turns into, well, I'm going to use my skills wherever I where I can, and so I think the software community has done a very good job at, at sort of providing those outlets. Great. So very good points there, um, but let me, while the both of you are here, let me try and uh, take some advantage of, uh, you know, uh, another another question here. We just held at George Washington University uh, the first inaugural business and policy forum uh, on April 27th of this year, and that was on attacking cybersecurity risks. The next one that we are holding is on April 2nd in 2024, which is really about the future, imagining the future with artificial intelligence, right? So while you are both here, I would like us to make you know, some inroads into what kind of uh, themes should there be. So tell me from a policy perspective, what are the key considerations and areas of focus we should be having at that particular conference for it to be a great one? Um, so I think for, you know, the big question, I think one that we're tackling is what is the role of government in AI? Mm -hmm. You know, what role should we play? What role uh, can we play? 
Uh, what role arguably shouldn't we play? You know, where should we, where, what lanes should we stay out of? And I think those are questions that we're having in, internally now um, of we want to make sure we play our role, but again, we, we don't want to get involved in areas where we shouldn't get involved. I think we are looking at, at AI on, on a three, from essentially three areas. One, you know, how do we use it internally? What is responsible use of AI internally to government? And how do we make sure we have the right uh, privacy, security, and other protections in place? So I think those are all topics that, that everybody is struggling with, right? Privacy issues and, and AI including, um, utilization of AI. We're also looking at from how our adversaries are going to use AI. And do we have a good understanding of what that, and how do we make sure our policies uh, and our efforts are positioned well enough uh, to defend against how an adversary may, may use AI? Uh, and then what, what do we look at responsible use in our space and critical infrastructure? What does that look like in the infrastructure com critical infrastructure community for AI? And, and what, whether guidance or, or information should go out there, who should put that out there you know, to, to help guide some of that? So I think there's a, there's a lot of topics uh, that can be covered mm -hmm. in that space. Well, I've got some talks here because um, I, I think business you know, uh, schools have a, a really large role here. And We've gone through these. Let me start taking notes here. Yeah, from me. absolutely. <laughs> I think we have this really tremendous shift that would just happened in the last sort of two years. And I'm not sure everyone fully recognized what happened, which is we've gone through waves of, of AI. First wave, sort of expert programming, right? So how do I you know, take the skills of someone who, let's say, is great at the you know, tax code, how do I put that in TurboTax? And then hope that the questions that are, are simple enough that I could actually pre-plan what those questions would be and make more efficient you know, ability to you know, do taxes or whatever, right? So that was sort of the first wave of software development. When I was at DARPA, we uh, actually projected that a computer would have vision right, uh, better than a human, right? and we projected 2020. Well, that happened in like 2013, right? So we were off by about seven years, and what happened is this big shift from data collection and then putting that into deep learning allowed for you know, capabilities that actually surprised us. Mm -hmm. So we just went through this wave. So that's second wave where you just collect a bunch of data and, and create bespoke models like the vision models. We just went through this big shift, which is second wave to third wave, which is contextual learning mm -hmm. right, based on foundational models. That second wave right, was all about the data scientist. And so they're still really important. But the third wave is about the end user. They're pre-built models. Right, whether it's GPT-4 or some variation like that, it's pre-built models, and what really matters right now is what you do with that. There are very specific people who are training those systems, and they have to be world experts, and those are you know, the computer scientists and the AI experts. The most interesting work that I'm seeing right now mm -hmm. is coming from the domain experts who have become experts not at how it's developed, but how it gets used. And that shift right, is happening in cybersecurity, and you have cyber experts who are really good at uh, figuring out how these large language model models can write code. It's happening in business, mm -hmm. retail, finance, health, government, right? And so actually asking the end user of AI questions, which wouldn't have been interesting two years ago. Two years ago, it's like, well, I need a data scientist to collect the data. Eight months from now, I might have a bespoke model that maybe I could use, and it's going to be narrow and fragile. Mm -hmm. Now everybody should be using it, and every organization needs to be using it because it's not great for everything, right? But you, you, you understand what it's good for, right? Mm -hmm. Through the end user actually figuring it out through their own challenge problems. So, so, so that's very informative, extremely informative. Let me ask you a follow-up question, and perhaps both of you, uh, to some degree, on this one uh, could jump in in different ways. And let me pose the two questions. One, you mentioned responsible AI. Yep. I would like to know who is leading that conversation on responsible AI in the country or in the world. And two, um, you, we talk about all these policy changes and regulations that might be necessary uh, as we look at um, artificial intelligence and other emerging technologies from, you know, it sounds great, from a person who doesn't work in this area. Could you be, give us a specific example of what regulatory change we should have or we should be considering and why, how it might change uh, the direction of uh, emerging technologies? Well, well, challenging question. So you, yeah, yeah, you, you, no, you, no. you flip a coin and decide who wants to go first. All right. So, you know, I, I do think we're at this phase, you know, it's, it's very new. And if I, from an enterprise level or even a university level, uh, the worst thing you can do is actually avoid it, right, in my opinion. And what 
I said earlier is actually really important. It's the domain experts who are leading the charge in like where it actually is working and where it isn't working. And so if you basically, from the IT shop or the CIO, say, well, I didn't get this thing right, so we're going to ban it from every, being used, that actually doesn't work. First, mm -hmm. people know the power of it, so they're going to use it anyway. They're going to use it in ways that you, know, you haven't you know, blessed. So a lot of people are just you know, going to ChatGBT and, and using it as opposed to using an enterprise grade. Uh, version where maybe their data is protected in a, a different way. Um, now, I would say there's lots of protections even around the ChatGPT, but um, you know, having not there's where your data goes, but then when should you actually use it for which type of problems? And that's where I think the domain experts are getting really good at it. And so, uh, how many people within your organization have hands-on keyboard and are raising that skill level mm -hmm. is as important, right? Uh, a metric is any metric, right? And I think a lot of organizations, including the government, are doing a bit of a stand back. Uh, you know, this is a disruption. How do I handle this disruption? What do we do? Some are aggressive. There's pockets that are super aggressive, and there's some that are standing back saying, well, I, I, how could I use this? And it's not going to be good enough for my job because my job's so important. That's actually exactly the wrong attitude. Right? It might be true, and you need to find that by using it. Right, and saying, okay, it actually isn't good because 90% of the people that use it realize, oh, I'm still better, but I'm better with it you know, mm -hmm. as a mm -hmm. collaboration. Mm -hmm. right? It's not taking my job. It's actually keeping me from having my job taken because I am you know, up to 40% more efficient, 40% more accurate in, in my job. And actually, really good studies coming out of Wharton, uh, Harvard, um, and MIT, they, they did some very systematic business studies. Where I was saying business schools have a big role here very systematic studies of where is the efficiency coming from, right? How do you, quantitate, you, know, you quantify that and for which type of, of domains? And that is not a computer science question. That is a you know, business utility question. And I'm starting to see some really good answers there. Great. I think you know, we're still in the early stages of trying to understand you know, how best do we look at this? You know, is it regulation? Is it guidance? Is it, in, is it market drivers and industry guiding this? I mean, you know, the, the regulation is the answer to some things. It's not the answer to everything. Um, and what, I think what we're really trying to uncover is make sure we, we don't lean too far forward too early and too fast and, and really end up in a position where, where we don't have that full understanding. And we want to make sure we ask the right questions, talk with our partners in industry, talk with our partners in academia, and make sure that, that we know what that potential path is and what the right path is. I think, you know, as we've talked to, to people in a lot of different critical infrastructure sectors, everything from healthcare across the board, I think what folks have talked about is obviously business optimization and the, tech, and the benefits of AI and technology. I think the question a lot of people are struggling with, struggling with is where is that line of human intervention? Where is that line of check and balance? Where is that line in which, you know, whether we're talking about, you know, healthcare delivery or assessment or analysis, or depending on what aspect we're talking about, where is that, that human check to make sure that, that this is or is not the step that we need to take? And I think a lot of industries are having those conversations internally. And, and that line is not a static line. That's not a static line across all sectors. And even within something as simple as healthcare, it's going to vary drastically, right, Be between you know, direct patient delivery and other systems. And so I think people are starting to explore the technology, understand the benefits, understand the limitations. I think, frankly, get a sense of what the future is going to hold, and then understand where do we set that right check and balance. And you don't start at the tip of the spear, yeah. right? You don't start at you know a hospital yeah. doing you know drug delivery, yeah. right? Like, <laughs> how do you raise the bar of really the skill level of the entire enterprise? Is step one, and you, and you do that by doing sort of the basics and the foundation. And I actually even ask on, on the educational front, right? It must be just as disruptive as any other front, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, how do you not be scared to say, well, what happens if I give them a take-home uh, essay to write. Don't do that. <laughs> like you, you hopefully have learned that that's really a bad idea right now because it's most likely going to come back much better than it would have last year right? because <laughs> of the support that these students uh, now know exists. So you have to flip the education process. right? Go learn as much as you possibly can. You now have a personal tutor that can teach you lots of things. Right? And don't be scared that it might actually learn from the computer and then come back and how much do you learn and now test them in that environment, right? which might be a controlled environment. Mm -hmm. Things like that, right? it's the shift the government's having to do. Like Every industry is going to figure out where those shifts are. And the only way you can get that wrong is to just like, try to ignore it. Right? Mm -hmm.
Yeah. No, my, my speeches have also gotten better since last year, I can tell you that. So I'm trying to combine some of the submitted questions with some of the topics that we are discussing. And one of them that, you know, we are, while we are in the topic of responsible AI ethics policy regulation that we are talking about is also the question of bias. And when we talk about bias in artificial intelligence, the question that is specifically being asked is, are we still promoting continued bias? Or is AI development getting sufficient representation from women people of color, and the younger generation today for that bias to actually reduce. What are you experiencing? I'll okay. start. Um, yeah, obviously, um, very difficult question. I think there are biases inherent to uh, AI, right? Because it's trained on information, and information has bias. So there's really no getting around that these biases uh, exist. I think one thing I, I've seen that's positive is that now through some of the new techniques like grounding, Right, or personalization, right? you can make the model what you want to make it by supporting it with your data. So I like to think about it as my bookshelf. right? So if you, not to get in too uh, in the weeds, but if you ground the model with your own uh, perspective, right, that will give you a different answer than if you just ask the, the model uh, on its own. So you have the ability to personalize it for like, who you are, right? as opposed to having this homogenous uh, answer that only you know is going to be trained by what the world believes, and every time you get it, you ask it, it regardless of your background, you are going to uh, just get a single answer. Right? That would actually be bad for humanity, in my opinion. And so, some of the personalization techniques that have emerged, I think, are actually really positive from that uh, perspective. Now, with that, it's a double-edged sword. People that have biases may right, reconfirm their biases by you know, having bad answers get worse, right? So I will say that that's not a one-way street, but I am actually uh, optimistic that you can, if you are a good person, right, have something that reflects your values, and so you have that optionality now. Yeah, yeah I agree. I think bias is still a factor and, and, and is an issue. I think to some extent it, it's, again, getting people to understand the, the tools that they're using, the models that they're using, and the limitations um, that they may have, and understanding that if you are looking at, at a model in a system that that has the potential to have inherent bias that you acknowledge as you go in. I mean, to me, it's not different from you know something as simple as, as reading news and reading things like that from various sources and understanding kind of the inherent source um, you know underlying in, in, in those newscasts and using that to help kind of guide your your decision making and helping guide your your formulation of your response as opposed to being kind of a root copy of, of what you think. So I think I think it is there. I think it, I'm really interested to see where it goes. I think as we go forward. Um, but t to me, a lot of it is just having that open mind and being able to, to understand the limitations uh, and the positives. Again, I don't want to be the negative to the positive, but at the same time, yeah. you know, really be, just being aware and open-minded and, and, and honest with yourself about that. Great. So I have, a, I have an eyes on the, uh, on the clock as well, so we're going to go into the speed round now. Okay. But there are multiple questions. So the first speed round question, I'm going to read it fast, which has been submitted, is what part of generative AI and or AI in general do you think is being underestimated, underutilized, or otherwise deserves more attention and experimentation during this wave of interest in AI? I have a feeling you will say all of the above, but go ahead, Nitin. <laughs> all the above. No, I think, uh, you know, I, I think what's being underutilized or what we're looking at, I think right now it's be getting, for us anyway, it's getting that better sense of how the adversaries might be using this against us in a malicious way. You know, I think we have a lot of good ideas of how it could be used with good intent. I think we need to spend more time on understanding how it could be used with, with bad intent. And let me ask you the question on partnerships, because there are a couple of these questions which are coming on partnerships, on, on private-public partnerships. Do you have an example of a good partnership? Do you think it's a good idea? That, that, and it is uh, going to be necessary as we have emerging technologies? And particularly, are these partnerships global? I want his question first. So cyber. <laughs> I knew cyber, you that, too. The inter <laughs> intersection of AI and cyber is about to pop in the next year uh, in very interesting ways, mostly good. Um, but it is something that is worth uh, paying a lot of attention to. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, in terms of you know, public-private partnerships, I think you know, the universities are getting disrupted, governments are getting disrupted, everybody's getting disrupted by what I think is the most important technology of our lifetime. That's definitely a biased opinion, but I've seen a bunch of technologies when I was at DARPA. This is the most important one that I've uh, seen. Um, okay, so. You need partnerships, right? I do worry that the government needs to be aggressive users, not for, let's say, operational things. Like, they need to be very informed about, you know, what they can do. I've talked to a lot of government 
policymakers. It's very clear they've never actually used the technology and they have very strong opinions about what it can and shouldn't do, right? So like, you know, making sure that there's avenues, and that's not their fault, right? If they're not, you know, necessarily uh, technology forward, right? They need partnerships, they need avenues for, uh, to be informed so they can you know, get that right. I, I do think it's a true test of all people, agencies, uh, organizations, enterprises, and uh, governments. And so they're going to have to have the, those, the technologists be able to inform what's possible. And again, I think the domain, domain users are going to be much more mm -hmm. uh, important. Right. Well, I started with a question from a student, and let me end the program with a question from a student. And of course, you would expect this to be the question, I feel, that what are the skills and specializations that are at the top of your list? Are you hiring? And how do I go around getting that job that you're hiring for? So yes. <laughs> uh, no, we uh, since we're definitely hiring, I think you know what we've really tried to do is, is I try to encourage folks. There's a role in cybersecurity for everybody, and so a lot of people are intimidated by entering cybersecurity because they feel I'm not a, a hacker, I'm not a coder, I don't have this skill or that skill. You know, in order to execute our cybersecurity mission, it takes a broad spectrum of individuals, right? It takes those what I call kind of hands-on keyboard individuals. We have people with deep technological experience, deep scientific experience, deep research experience people who are experts in their field and everything from cloud computing to, to, to coding. We have strong red teams, ethical hackers, a whole spectrum of people. We also have people who do communications. We have people who do finance, people who work with us to get the message out to partners in a way that is understandable. We like to speak two languages at CISO. We speak binary and we speak English. Um, and making sure we can get our message out there to both communities. And so it takes a broad spectrum of individuals. The other thing we've been able to do, I'll, I'll just flag briefly, is that a lot of people are intimidated by coming into the federal government, right? Because it's easier to solve you know, uh, a, a huge puzzle than to, to figure out how to enter the federal service. We actually have new hiring authorities that are based on, I know this sounds absolutely crazy, competency. So we have the ability to hire people not based on you know, knowledge, skills, abilities, and essays, and frankly, just pure academics, but we have the ability to hire kids fresh out of high school who have strong technical acumen to put them through testing and hire them into federal service and not require them to go to a four-year school or to graduate school before they join uh, the federal government um, through a thing called the cyber talent management system. So we have new opportunities to bring in individuals uh, at various stages of their career by demonstrating their technical acumen and joining the federal service. And we actually have a lot of folks that have come in and out of government these days. So it's no longer the case where people are coming in for 20, 30 years and retiring. A lot of people like myself are going back and forth from the private sector from government and the private sector back and forth. And I think that, that we're really trying to change uh, the perception of what is a federal employee um, and tapping into that the, the vastness of the nation. Now, that was a compelling yeah. one, so beat that now. For well, I mean, I, let me amplify what he said. Like, everyone <laughs> here should feel that public service is a part of what they do. And there's a lot of different ways to do public service, but there should be a part of your career that is actually you know, really focused on working for others. And the government's a good way uh, to do that. And so I, I gave up tenure to, at Purdue to actually work for the government. I think most people thought I was uh, crazy. Um, <laughs> maybe I was, but it, you know, I would say that it, it was actually the most fulfilling you know, part of my career. Don't tell my boss. Um, <laughs> but you know, because I'm, you're, there's many times which you are working to make money. Right? There's a few times that you get to work for the, the broader good. Right? And so what you're doing, I think, is actually uh, amazing. And I do think that, you know, specifically CISA, right, protecting elections, protecting water, protecting our energy system, I can't think of anything more important than to actually to do that. So I would say, uh, you know, dive in, right? You don't have to be the most advanced coder in the world. The skill levels are, or, are, or the abstraction levels are raising so that if, as a domain expert, you can you know, dive in, build things, be good at what you do, right, mm -hmm. and then do public service on top of that, and you will be happy with your career because if you're good at, uh, at what you do, there will be uh, commercial opportunities that will come across that, uh, you know, across that journey for your well, career. So. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for a fantastic conversation. Please, thank you very much. I enjoyed it very much. And I also want to thank all of you who have joined us today and invite you to the next session of George Talks Business Series. On November 1st, we invite you to join us for a conversation with Ellen M. Granberg, the 19th president of the George Washington University. We look forward to that conversation and hope you can join us then. Thank you again.